tu vida, esta es de, parte de las series historias de nuestras vidas y hay en la audiencia solamente una persona que no habla inglés y ella accedió a que entonces no tengamos que estar hablando y traduciendo al mismo tiempo, entonces voy a, eh, a escribir toda la historia en español y quien guste la historia en español, yo se la, me preguntan y yo la puedo proporcionar. Um, so since, um, since there is only one person who doesn't speak English in the audience today, um, we're not going to be translating uh, simultaneously, but I'm going to write the story in Spanish and it will be available for whoever needs it, wants it. They just have to ask and we'll do it that way. Meanwhile, um, he uh, will have all the freedom to share his whole story. <laughs> oh, whatever she said, okay. And thank you so much for your service. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I was born in a small farming and agriculture town in Whirling, Wyoming in 1935. And as my wife would say, only because I wanted to be near my mother. Uh, the population was just a little over 2,000. It was a very small building. I thought I could project it out. Okay, we got it now. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was aboard ship, I never had to use a microphone. I could project my voice. Okay, here we go again. Uh, it's born in 1935. World of Wyoming had a population of just over 2,000. It was a very small community. The movie theater was only open on the weekends, only had one traffic light in the middle of the city, which was about two blocks long. Dad was a mechanic and mom was a housekeeper, even though she did have teaching credentials from uh, her college days at Hannibal, Missouri. Uh, Dad was a member of the Masons and mom was a uh, member of the women's group of the Eastern Stars. Uh, Dad was born and raised in Quincy, Illinois. Mom was born and raised in Hannibal, Missouri. If that sounds familiar, that's because Tom Sawyer. There you go. Uh, they married, and several years later, they relocated to Worland, where her mom and two brothers lived. I spent time at Uncle Clay's. Uh, he had two boys and two girls. The boys were in their early teens and already driving Uncle Clay's tractor and riding the horses into town. So you can tell how small that place was. Uh, Uncle Clay uh, raised the kids. They had their chores to do and they did it. The girls were more around the house and the boys were out in the, the fields. On Sunday, December 7th, 1941, life changed. Mom took my brother and I to church for the first time that night. First time she'd ever done that. There was a lot of long and sober faces and I could understand why because it was smart. Mom and Dad didn't talk to us much about what was happening out in the Pacific. In the spring of 42, they packed us up and moved us in a car and moved down to Cheyenne, Wyoming. My dad found a job and rented a house, and Mom uh, began her uh, pick up again with the Eastern Star. And then my formal college, college my formal education began, going through grade school. First, Mom made my brother and I go to Sunday school, First Baptist Church, and afterwards stay for church. Pastor White, I can still remember this, Pastor White, he wore tuxedo when he was up on the platform, and he had the nose pierced note glasses up there, just like fire and brimstone. I used to sit on the side of the church over there with my brother, trying to keep a low profile. Oh yeah, I was, I was having fun. Uh, Later, uh, when I was baptized through the church, I was given a Bible, which I still have today. It's in a cedar chest at home. I struggled through the school system, enjoying life, and eventually graduated the second week in June 1954. You can see where this is leading to. I had gone to the post office to sign up for the Marine Corps. Mom was not too thrilled about the whole situation. When I went to see the Marine recruiter, his door was closed. There was no one there. As I turned to leave, I saw another military gentleman. This is the Navy Chief Head Officer standing there. After a brief conversation, he had me convinced that the Navy was a much better deal than the Marines. So I signed uh, the initial papers and took them home for Mom and Dad to sign. She was much happier that I was going to the Navy rather than the Marines. Mom then mentioned something to the fact, I think we know this guy from the Moose Lodge. It's a fraternal organization. 
So rather than uh, having a three to four months delay on entry, I was on a Greyhound bus headed for Denver, Colorado in two weeks. Short time. I think they're trying to get rid of me. I took my physical and the battery written test along with others from Wyoming, Colorado area. Those of us that passed were put on a train head for the West Coast. We, when we made it here to San Diego, we saw the Pacific Ocean for the first time. And the girls in their shorts. <laughs> at the receiving station at the Navy Training Center, I knew my life was really changing. I'm with the big fellows now. Uh, we did marching, daily inspections, learned a new language, like walls were called bulkheads, bathrooms were called heads. We learned how to tie a knot for specific jobs. Floors were decks and more mops were swabs. And the clothing ceiling was overhead. Never understood all that, but I got down pat. Upon completion of boot training, I was shipped off to the East Coast for Navy Navigation and Signaling School, then back to the West Coast to report aboard my first Navy vessel. It was called an AKA, an attack cargo ship. The only thing made it, it was like a big merchant ship with booms and boats. And the only thing made an attack was a three inch gun on the stern. When the ship returned to uh, Long Beach after four months in Portland, Oregon, going through an overhaul, the, state, the Navy sent me another set of orders to report to, to another ship. It was called an LST, landing ship tank. The, the original landing ship tank was designed with an idea from Winston Churchill. They took an old oil tanker, put bow doors on it, emptied the hulls out so they could take their rolling stock to the beach. The Navy built these LSTs and used in the southern ports, Louisiana, stuff like that. But this one, the 561, was 328 feet long, 58 feet wide, designed to beach and offload vehicles and supplies directly onto the beach. Maximum speed, if it was going downhill, was 12 knots. We usually traveled about 8 knots. Uh, when we made our trip to, my first trip to Westpac, she stopped at Yakuska, which is the big naval base there, Kobe, Nagoya, and Iwo Jima then before returning to the States in preparation for going to the Arctic Circle as part of Operation Dewline. Dewline stood for Distant Early Warning. And that was uh, about 330 radar sites all the way from Point Barrow across the Canadian border to where we were at Shepherd's Bay. We were closer to the East Coast than we were the West Coast. And what they were doing, the radars were always watching for the old bombers coming out of Alaska. That was before we had satellites. Okay. It was during these months uh, at sea, I met a young man aboard the ship who was the ship's lay leader. Uh, he held Sunday services because the ship didn't have or rate chaplains at that time. And that's when he was trying to get me to come over to the Lord's side. Uh, when the ship returned to Long Beach, we met at the First Baptist Church where he pointed out a cute blonde in the choir. After a whirlwind courtship and nearly seven months later, Mary Jean and I were married. Woo! Yeah. We finally got it. Uh, a little bit about uh, Mary Jean's father. Uh, Mary Jean's father was uh, from Palermo, Italy. He came to the United States. There you go. He came to the United States to become a priest, but instead he joined the Navy. What does that tell you? <laughs> and she always claims that he was probably part of the mafia. But anyway, <laughs> big family. Uh, he, when he joined the Navy uh, he, uh, in 1931, by June 42, he was a radioman chief, following uh, by promotion to warrant officer. And he was also made a, a citizen at that time. Mary Jean set up an apartment in, after we got married, she set up an apartment in Long Beach while I continued my adventures with Uncle Sam. It wasn't long afterward that I received another set of orders to uh, report to Beach Jumper Unit 1 in Cornell, California. Now, uh, you've ever heard of Douglas Fairbanks Jr.? I'm sure you have. He 
was in the beach jumpers on the East Coast, and they were involved in the invasion of Italy. They would sit off the beach and put these big speakers out there playing the sounds of war, ships offloading and all that. Deception is what it was. Now, when it was on the West Coast, it got more involved in psychological warfare. So uh, the beach jumpers were tasked with electronic tactical deception and psychological warfare. By this time, I had uh, risen in the rank to a second-class petty officer, and after talking to my wife, I'd made the decision to stay in and re-enlist. I had just completed my first four years. My next duty station was at Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay, and that was for two years. And this two years of shore duty was my only tour of shore duty in 23 years in the Navy. Kept her happy. <laughs> Uh, we lived in the Navy housing on the Berkeley side of the bay. It was almost like we were lepers there. No contact with civilians. It was the way the locals treated military in that part of the country up there. After 1961, I was advanced to E6, first class petty officer, and reported aboard the USS Alamo, LSD-33, out of San Diego. My ship made routine Westpac deployments to the Philippines, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Okinawa, and then we returned to San Diego. At one time, we had a, uh, to make an emergency deployment to, on a good Friday, to Kodiak, Alaska. That's when they had the big earthquake and everything shifted from one side to the other. And the economy up there required a dry dock to repair all their small fishing crab boats. So we got picked up to, uh, to take it up there. After we returned to San Diego for some hot peak of the underway again for Westpac. One morning we had nearly 11 ships with us in formation. The following day, there was only five. The rest had gone down to Cuba for the Cuban Missile Crisis. Those were exciting times. We swimmed, uh, those that were still left in formation steamed down to Guam, rested there two days, see if the other ships were going to catch up with us, and then we went on to the Philippines. And at the same time, later in that same deployment, when we loaded the, our amphibious ready group uh, out of the Okinawa, we took them down to uh, Da Nang and offloaded them. They were the first boots on the ground in Vietnam, but was still, the pot was still boiling at that time. Those troops there were not for, uh, for combat troops, but for secure the air base. We went back to Okinawa, picked up another 2,000 plus Marines and took them down to Quignon, same thing, for defense of the harbor. We made a turnaround trip to and from Okinawa to build up the ground force at Danang again. Back to the States for a short breather and then we went to Port Wanimi where we loaded uh, the CBs, their heavy equipment and material and men for a return trip to Vietnam to Da Nang. Before heading back home, we backloaded a badly damaged PT boat. That was the same type of craft that President Kenny rode in World War II. But the North Vietnamese, South Vietnamese were using them to put their people ashore up north. And that's where they, uh, the boat got all shot up. We took it back to the Philippines uh, for repair. And about this same time, in route back to the States, I got another set of orders. I was uh, being uh, sent to Boat Squadron 1, which was being formed at the Naval Amphibious Base. Now, this is uh, October, November. Now, I was being assigned as a staff quartermaster for Coastal Squadron 13. It's got the black cat and all that. The first two of our boats for the squadron, three and four, were already en route to Antoy, which is a little island off Fukuok Island, up in the Gulf, what used to be called the Gulf of Siam. The next group went up to Da Nang, and then the third group, which I was in, was at Cat Low down at Vung Tau. Uh, the first two boats were already. On February 66, boat number four, which was down at Antoy, uh, was sunk by a mine, which killed four men. And the boat officer, what they were looking, there was a VC flag flying in the water. The boat officer wanted a souvenir. 
when they reached over to pick it up, Charlie was over in the bush, contact detonated, and the boat officer uh, lived, but he lost a leg, but the four other enlisted aboard the boat were killed. And the radio man who was on the fan tail when all this happened, he was rescued, taken to Saigon Hospital, but he did not want to leave country, so they made him a, a radio man there at the staff. Uh, boats one and two, which was supposed to be here at San Diego, arrived by train at the amphibious, by train at the amphibious base by the end of November. Uh, then all of our underway training began, night operations. Uh, we went out to San Camille Island for live firing and getting our sea legs. More classes in small arms, first aid, and SEER training. SEER training stands for survival, escape, re resistance, and evasion. And that came as a result of, uh, during the Korean War, there were a lot of soldiers, a lot of soldiers, who turned tail. They gave up their own people just to survive. So the uh, military said, we're going to tighten this up. So all the, anybody going to Vietnam had to go through SEER training. They drummed that into a lot of patriotism and all that. We tried to find, uh, the first night after our initial what I'll say, I'll say about chewing. Uh, classes, excuse me, classes, the, what to expect during this next five days, if you will. And then they took us down to the beach over at North Island, go find some food, and this is where you're going to sleep the first night. But they did give us a sh uh, parachute shrouds. We could either make a big tent out of it or wrap us up like a mummy without food. Because the beach had already been picked clean by all the aviators having to go through seer training up there. It's getting interesting, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but seer training was done out by Warner Springs, and this is November, December, right around Thanksgiving time. Uh, to keep warm, we wrapped ourselves in parachute shrouds. In the morning, we were carted off to Warner Springs, and there we spent three and a half days in a simulated prisoner war compound. Guards wore Russian green uniforms. They even flew the communist flag. That was all a result of the Korean conflict. We got a lot of, we got brain wars at that time, why this happened. Very interesting stories on there. During one of the exercises, we were trying to evade our captors, and if we made it to a certain place at the end of the big field, we would be given coffee and sandwiches. I was one of the few who was successful, but they lied. They didn't have coffee or sandwiches there. They stripped us down to our skivvies, put us in the truck, insulted us the whole way, and put us in the compound. Then you stood outside in your skivvies, what seemed hours, but they harangued you, told you what was going to happen, broke us up into smaller groups. After that, they ran us through an interrogation and included waterboarding, oh yeah, being slapped, hollered out, and in insulted, and then put us in the box about the size of a doghouse. I was okay at this time because I said, well, let's be over with two days, three days. I was okay till that heavy set cook, the next week in the box, broke down and started sobbing. <laughs> it's hell to hear a I'm sorry. It's heck to hear a grown man cry, I tell you. But I figured, you know, they can kill you, but they can't eat you. So we went on from there. On the final moment, we, called, we were called out of our dugouts, and the comments commanding officer, and I still remember his name, Lieutenant Commander Childress. And how many years ago was that? Seventy years ago. Yeah. So there's certain things that stick up here. His final comment, after we spent our three and a half days, where he says, gentlemen, that ends the problem. No one moved. No one moved. We were standing at either prayed rest or attention because he was, we were expecting another hour-long dissertation. Then he repeated, gentlemen, the program is over. And we started looking around to see if anybody's moved. We didn't want to get slapped. Okay. Well, the troops then escorted us back to the base camp to await transportation back to the base. At the base camp, we all talked about how much we were going to eat when we got back to the amphibious base sitting down with pancakes, scrambled eggs, and toast and coffee. We really didn't even make a dinner. Our stomachs had shrunk. I lost seven pounds that week. Good way to go on a diet. At home, my wife didn't even want to wash my clothes. She just dumped them in the trash can. 
and after, <laughs> boy. Um, my group of Swifties had already been shipped out for the Philippines. In the Philippines, we received additional shots and training before being loaded onto Navy ships, LSDs. The staff personnel shipped out on the ship that came out of Mr. Roberts. Do you remember that movie? It was an AKL light cargo ship. All the holes were up floor. James Cagney was the skipper and all that. That's the type of ship we went over from, from Zubik over to Vung Tau. Then we sit out, the, out in the harbor and waited for harbor pilots to take us up the river to Catlow. And it was also the uh, twin sister of the USS Pueblo. If you remember the Pueblo, that was a spy ship that the uh, North Vietnamese thought was a spy, uh, was in their water. They were taken under fire. One gentleman was killed aboard there. And Booker gave up the ship. They brought, after his year in determined ship, they brought him back to the States and they gave him a court martial. They always have to find somebody to hang for something went wrong. But it was, now this is me, I'm political now. It was not his fault, it was the higher ups because they didn't have things ready to intercede or protect him down there. It's like a postman's holiday. Enough. Okay. Oh, boy. Now, swift boats are a 50 foot aluminum, welded aluminum hull craft with a crew of one officer and five enlisted. All the enlisted are cross trained into everybody else's job. As a quartermaster on the boat, I would have to know, know how to strip the 50s, 50 calibers, fire the mortar, do engine light maintenance, change oil, and that sort of stuff to see. And the engine was expected to do partly navigation and same thing. Everybody's cross trained. And it was armed, the swift boats are armed with two 50 caliber machine guns above the pilot house, which was on a swivel. And they had a 50 caliber or an 81 millimeter mortar back aft. That was from the Coast Guard, we got that. And everybody utilized a weapon that was carried on board, either the automatic rifle, which the news has brought up lately in these mass school shootings, or 45. Uh, the boats were to be utilized along the Vietnamese coast and in our case up the rivers to stop the infiltration of men and supplies from the North Vietnam. When we arrived at Catlow, we had two boats to start our patrols. Um, uh, and anyone not on patrol spent time filling sand bags, sandbags, and building a bunker. That gets tiresome. Uh, no one used uh, no one used the bunker because of snakes and spiders, and they had some big ones, yeah. Uh, more, more boats arrived a little later on in our patrol area increased from the ocean into the rivers in pairs. There was nearly 1,500 miles of interior waterways. Admiral Zumwalt then started Operation Sea Lord. That stood for sea, land, lakes, ocean, and delta. This was to stop the inter, uh, stop interdiction and traffic in the Delta. He then started Operation Ranch Hand, which sprayed Agent Orange. His son was on the, now this is after I was there. They started, they, uh, they did do Agent Orange, but his son came after I was there. But his son got that Agent Orange. So he, we had one member of our church here it was actually yeah, Sandy's husband was uh, got. Uh, he was in Saigon. He received Agent Orange. I'd say. Uh, uh, while in the river ops, we lost seven boats. We lost 50 Swifters killed in action and 300 wounded. We had a total of 108 t boats in country, losing 11. We lost three to heavy seas, so they weren't really that seaworthy. At Catlow, in the year that I was there, we lost one boat with one killed, 13 wounded. This year in country, I was promoted to a chief petty officer, which I always looked forward to. That was the pit of my military career, I was making chief. And several months later, I was notified I'd been promoted to chief warrant officer. That was a big feather in my cap. Only catch was I had to attend the officer's candidate school, which we in the Navy called the Knife and Fork School, at Newport, Rhode Island. So my promotion was delayed one year till I finished my tour in country. 
Billy, you staying with me? Okay. <laughs> Once the indoctrination was completed, I was then appointed in a full, as a full commissioned officer in the Navy. Finishing classes, I returned to the amphib base and became an instructor for those going over to Vietnam. This lasted nearly nine months. Once again, I got orders again, this time for another LSD, 19, USS Comstock. More training before going, uh, going over. I got to add one point this time. One was on this, W1. I was God's gift to the Navy. But anyway, uh, I was, warrant officers are charged with, boatswains are charged with all the maintenance and upkeep of everything above the main deck aboard ship. Rigging, deck painting, and all that, and the LSDs, the well deck operations. Comstock was getting underway to go for another Westpac operation. And we no sooner got underway, I was up stationed back aft, and the PA system came up, both of them to the bridge. What now? I went up to the bridge, and the captain, I could tell he was upset. He had veins on his neck were sticking out. He told me to get the LCPL ready. Mr. So-and-so was being kicked off the ship. Whoa, okay. So put the boat at the rail, loaded the ensign, sent him down to the naval station, and the Comstock went out and anchored out until the VP got back. That time I was told I was taking over first division. That was everything, all the superstructure forward. I didn't, there were several things went out there. He apparently had written a letter, not through the chain of command. So he was kicked off the ship and the second class yeoman who assisted him was given captain's mass soon after the ship got underway and we went from a second class down to third class. So the captain got really upset about that. But anyway, as I digress, uh, when she got, when the Comstock got underway, Pearl Harbor, Philippines, and while we were in the Philippines, and then to the uh, South China Sea, uh, we did Operation Game Warden in support of Vietnam and Sea Float. Now, Sea Float, uh, we worked with the Army on this one here. We went up to Na Bay, ballasted down, and they brought out these big causeways, which you see in World War II movies, uh, landing on D-Day, where they drive trucks, vehicles across them. We brought those on ours. We had, what, two sections, three sections. They had howitzers on these guns. And our job was to take them down to the Delta, a certain location, and they were to be pulled, pushed, taken up the rivers, and that's where they would station them so they could provide fire support for the troops who were out there mushing in, in the marsh. From there, uh, we went to uh, then we got a call to go to Korea for a joint exercise with the Koreans. One thing is, while we were headed towards Korea, we caught the tail end of a typhoon. And that's a nasty riding ship. But because we couldn't make it to Korea, the, the three other LSDs are with us, they dispersed us and we got to go down to Zamboanga. You've heard the song, there is no monkeys. Monkeys got no tail in Zamboanga. They were bitten off by whales. Monkeys got no tail in Zamboanga. <laughs> uh, there was a movie on this morning. They were expendable, John Wayne. They sang that song in a movie. And the only thing down Zamboanga was it was a leper colony, so what the heck. Uh, heading back to the States, we were informed that the ship was being decommissioned at Bremerton, Washington right after the first year. We had that in fine order and in fact was a bit ahead of schedule. In the early 70s then I was sent to my next ship, the USS Thomaston, which was another LSD. More training, local ops and back to the Philippines and the coastal waters off Vietnam. After a seven months tour and heading back home I was issued another set of orders, this time to Beach Master Unit 1. Uh, which is a light salvage outfit at 10 Phoebus Space. When I reported in, I was uh, put on as an officer in charge of a light salvage and recovery team. During my tour with BMU-1, uh, I rode numerous ships during their deployment. Whenever an amphibious squadron deploys to Westpac, they generally, 99.9% .9 will have a Beachmaster unit 
attached with one of the ships. So that way, when the landing craft make their run to the beach, as you've seen the war movies and all that, they will come in after the third boated wave and straighten out the boats or raise the ramps of any landing craft or rope. Inoperative. Uh, <clears throat> during this period, we did, in fact, do an operation in Alaska, the first one. Five minutes? <gasps> I still got a half hour. <laughs> See what happens? See what happens when you get me going? Okay. Uh, during that time, a team uh, actually covered a uh, Marine LVT, and we got uh, the team got some nice Navy letters for that. Hmm? No. But uh, back at the Beach Masters, uh, the, we had a new commanding officer by that time. He was ex Army, went to the Navy, and when he got uh, to the Beach Masters, he said, Well, we ought to do some training in the desert. So we, got, we were supposed to be trained with the SEALs. We were going to be the bad guys. They trained with live ammunition, and we didn't have anything. Wow, yes. But we did do, we did, uh, do paddling in the rubber boats, and then we do a compass hike to designate points. It, so what was I getting into? Oh, well. Uh, finally, in 1977, I retired from service after 23 satisfying years. I personally believe that military-wise, with all the responsibilities and being left behind with kids and household problems, deserve the utmost recognition, which they don't get. They really don't get it. And it's their strength and commitment that we military men and women are able to fulfill our jobs and responsibilities. Thank you, lady. After military service in 77, I went to work for, some of you might remember the Highlander Clothers in the Chula Vista. They had seven other stores. Uh, I got to be, after four years, I made warehouse managers. They didn't hire kids anymore, they hired the old folks. Uh, the, one of the owners uh, died and the other decided to call it quits, so they folded up all the stores. And I went to work with the uh, gentleman of mine who was working at the Boys and Girls Club, asked me to come over and give him a hand. And that I really enjoyed. I got to help the kids with the little woodworking projects. In fact, I was working on my garage, I enjoyed it too. Uh, evident, eventually, the club closed some of its operations and I had to go looking for another job. And it was at this time that the Maritime Museum of San Diego got a swift boat from Malta, which they'd had for over 20 years, which uh, the Navy they had uh, gifted them a swift boat. And they used that for over 20 years down there. Uh, I took the docent class, test, and now I spend my Saturdays down there. Plus, I take private tours and groups when called upon. I've been there, what, 10 years now? 10 years. Uh, my wife said it's a second home. Uh, making chief and then the commissioned warrant officer was quite a personal accomplishment. I retired from the Navy with full honors after 23 years. When I was home, I enjoyed spending time with my boys while camping and with the scouts. Later, when my daughter took up Miss Softball America, I helped co coach her team. And one of the things I remember about her when she was up there, she says, Dad, remember, I'm a girl. So there was, This is always a fun time. I believe the Lord was always there for me, especially in Southeast Asia. I can recall being at my station on the stern, going up the rivers, I would hum some of the old Christian songs like Onward Christian Soldiers or Jesus Loves Me. Anything to take, make me feel better and take my mind off what was going on. I also remember a religious picture. This has nothing to do with it, but it was a big mural, big wall, big door, and Jesus is reaching for the handle. But do you look at it, there's no hand. No, I have to. Oh, damn it. <laughs> Thank you. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. What a life. Oh. We want to say thank you so much, Benny. Thank you for sharing your story. There's so much to that. How many, how many tours in Vietnam is that? That is countless so thank you for your service and um, I don't know I won't always want to stay in a place where Jesus can always make me cry 
and you're right. Remember the handle's on the inside and we open the door and Jesus comes in and that's what we do. So when it, and only we can open the door, right, right. He, God is such a, a gentleman. God will never impose himself on us, but if we ask, he comes to our aid. So let's take a moment and say thank you so much to Benny, and this will be recorded so anyone who missed it can come and see this in the, in the future. So thank you so much, Benny. And thank you for your service. I do apologize, I was supposed to have that photo of the ship and I, Okay, we will have that in the future. We want to honor our, our um, members of our second service, so we want to invite you to come and prepare as you need to as we prepare for not just service, but for a baptism in our second service. So thank you all very much.